Uh, my name is Harold Smith. I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Moncton. Um, at the core of what our business does is we developed a platform where government agencies can build mobile applications that conform to NSA's NIAP standards. So um, NIAP is mandatory for national security, secret, and top secret systems. Um, our goal was if we can build a product that satisfies TS environments, that can roll all the way down to FOU, OCUI, SBU kind of environments as well. So by going, tackling the hard problem, it's real, a lot easier to solve the simple problems. Along with that, um, we have built in support for uh, NIST AAL2 and AAL3 credentials. So AAL2 AL and 3, um, it defines uh, hardware tokens, like so if you work for the government, uh, your CAC PIV card, uh, we can support those tokens, uh, the soft cert versions of them, as well as uh, YubiKey and uh, a few others. So we actually uh, were part of YubiKey's recent um, iPhone support. So they rolled out, uh, are rolling out uh, the 5CI keys, which can go into the lightning ports. Um, we can do PIV, uh, NFC, and OTP off that, or I think it's OTP off that. So, you know, it, it's all, our, our whole goal is, could we give this SDK platform to um, the Candy Crush developers and could they build classified mobile applications? That's sort of our criteria of how we actually do all of this. Um, and I'll just continue with that slide. So, so um, Moncton, so uh, to prove our claims, since you know any vendor can claim conformance to anything, we decided to take our product through the NSA's accreditation process, which is called NIAP, which is an extension of common criteria. It's a national information assurance partnership. So um, if you want to be a component that can run in a uh, NSS secret or top secret environment, you have to go through formal validation with the NSA. So that involves hiring a uh, common criteria test lab, which is authorized by NIST. They do an evaluation on your product and the NSA then validates that evaluation. It takes about, you have to be done within 180 days, but the average is about 90. If you aren't done, done in 180 days, the NSA kicks you out and you have to start all over again. So it's a lot of incentive, you know, if, how many people are, are here with the federal government? So all of you commercial people have it so much easier because <laughs> like, you know, when you get into FedRAMP and, and the fun things like that, um, you know, uh, 180 days would be unheard of in FedRAMP to go through. So, you know, that collapsing that timeline down for us, especially on the software side, was really important. Um, we're, we took our iOS version of our product through that process, and we're going to be taking our Android version through that process as well. We don't have to do it. We just like to do it because it's a good, you know, part of our story. Um, so, I'll just read through my slides are, you know, bullet points anyway. So, um, what was our life like pre-GitLab? Um, we were using a lot of what I consider hodgepodge tools together. So, you know, I'm not trying to slam on their competitors, but, you know, we were using Jenkins, um, runners for Jenkins, or um, uh, I can't think of the right, right word. I know master-slave is the wrong terminology anymore, but it's agents, yes. <laughs> agents um, of GitLab to run, compile. It, it was tedious, I think is the right, way, right word to use. Um, you know, it, it felt like we were trying to keep the plate spinning 24-7. Um, getting runners up and running on hardware was pretty difficult. Uh, for, to build iOS applications, you need a physical iOS or uh, Mac OS server. So you have to install the Jenkins uh, software in there, set it up, and then sort of manage it. And it just became tedious I in many ways. So. We, we even deployed this in Amazon or in AWS, and we ran into some issues of you know just trying to keep instances running, uh, databases, security. It, it just it, it was just unmanageable for us, you know, being a small company, trying to be lean, trying to automate everything. So we started using GitLab um, earlier last year, and that really became our path of how do we help automate everything for our customers. Um, you know, getting away from the traditional you know process of build it submit it somewhere, you know, I, I don't have to sell the whole CICD story to everybody in this room, I would hope not. Um, you know, it was just, how do we go from a very tedious manual process to something that's completely automated? And, and most important of all, we wanted to build out a process that our customers could leverage. Um, the, the end goal was, we want to eat our own dog food that we're going to sell to customers. 
And that, that was really important to us of, you know, a planning goal of our migration to GitLab was, you know, how do we ensure that what we're doing is something our customers can use? And that was where sort of baselining with FedRAMP was our table stakes of we have to do this in order to move forward. Um, yeah, so uh, our, as I said, you know, our, our table stakes were, was that it has to be a process that our customers can leverage um, from deployment to disaster recovery um, to, <laughs> to, yeah, there we go, finally. <laughs> Thank you all. You know, from deployment, disaster recovery, to setting up runners in an automated fashion. Um, within AWS, we use a series of cloud formation scripts that we built, so we can just say, here, launch this, it's up and running wherever we want it to go. Um, reality, um, it, it did take us a little bit longer than we wanted, and that wasn't because of GitLab, that was more of you know, constraints on our, our side. Um, we thought we'd be done in about three months. It was more, more about five months to get everything over and get a lot of the automated process done. Um, and one big lesson is not everything needs to be automated. So, you know, there are a few things that, um, you know, documentation, scripts, and we, there's just no need to automate some of this stuff. So, you know, one of my takeaways for everybody is look at what you're trying to automate and what are your end goals. You know, is it a project specific set of um, goals that you have out of it or is it a group of projects specific goals? And you know, really define what needs to be automated, why are you automating it, what tools are you using to automate it and sort of you know, wrap your head around where are you trying to get. Um, for us the, pro the process is much, much easier. Um, we are doing things that I wouldn't been able to do about a year ago from some of the automated testing we're doing. We've actually built some of our own CI CD tools for command line. So if we want to do uh, dynamic application testing, there's a company called Now Secure, which we partnered with, where they can actually test your mobile application on a physical device that's been rooted so they can inspect you know, web traffic, um, what secrets have been stored in key stores, all those good things. And uh, with other CI CD tools, it was very painful to integrate with them. Um, in a few hours, we wrote a command line tool to be able to upload the binary. It takes about 15 minutes for it to scan, so it'll just sit there and wait for the results to come back. And if the results fail, it kills the, the merge. So you know, it's a very, it allows us to put those controls in when I'm going from you know, feature branches to dev master to uh, master branches, we can really control that. And the same goes for some of our static testing. We're using some of the built-in now secure static analysis, but we're also using third-party third party tools like check marks to continue um, building upon that. So as I look at you know, regulated <coughs> industry, government, you know, it's not just what one tool am I gonna be using to do static testing or dynamic testing, it's what suite of tools am I gonna um, grab so we can get a better picture because I, I don't believe any stat, any scanning tool that's going to give you you know dynamic or static scanning is going to give you all the results you want. But if you layer those tools on top of each other, you're going to be testing for a lot of different things. Um, and in reality, uh, one of the big things we did as a company was. Uh, so part of our platform is a server hub that gets deployed into Amazon or Azure. GitLab really enabled us. We, we decided late last year to get rid of as much technical debt as we possibly could as we start to scale out in uh, 2019 and going into 2020. Um, we were deploying everything with Docker. Um, you know, it, it worked, but that, that really wasn't where we wanted to be. So we've made a big push to serverless computing. So for anybody that doesn't know, serverless is I just throw code somewhere Amazon manages it, deploys it, sets up servers. You don't have to really manage anything. Um, in my opinion, it's the one cloud technology nobody's really leveraging yet. Everybody's going Docker, containers. But serverless is something completely different. Um, so if you're thinking about serverless, I entirely recommend it. Um, so as I said previously, you know, we've integrated third party static testing, dynamic testing, and those really um, so our build process is the developer checks in code, code review. It begins the uh, code quality analysis after a code review, static testing, dynamic testing, and then deployment. Um, so that static and dynamic testing after you get through uh, code, quali code quality checks, that's really a determination for deployment. 
Um, what we've really tried to show our uh, government customers is this stuff really isn't hard. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt out there of, you know, it takes a long time to build and deploy something. And it just, it's simply not, you know, I, I think probably everybody in this room knows that deploying anything really isn't, <laughs> you know, unless you really want to make it difficult, it, it actually isn't difficult. Um, so our overall benefits, uh, our real goal is we want to eat our own dog food. So what we're building out from how we configure and deploy uh, build servers for um, iOS applications, we're automating that. We're even going to down the path of uh, Apple has this program called device enrollment where I can map. When you order a device, you get the serial number for that device. You can put it into an MDM, and then you can automatically configure it. So we're trying to go down the path of can I just register that Mac OS build server with Apple. When I turn it on, it downloads Xcode, downloads all the build tools, downloads the GitLab runner interface. So it's just automatically deployed. Um, that's, a lot, uh, that's a lot easier said than done. Um, <laughs> there's, there's no real easy way to do that. Um, but it also goes to, you know, we learned a lot of lessons on uh, building GitLab runners. So how many people are using runners to build things Docker with Docker? Um, so, so for those that might not know, GitLab runners are where code can be compiled or you can run tasks within GitLab. So we have a series of runners. We have one for .NET, so it's a custom Docker image that has some extra tools built into it. It's actually been hardened a good bit beyond what you get from you know, the Ubuntu images. Uh, we have a custom Android runner, which is horribly bloated. It's about 10 gigabytes, which is a lot. <laughs> but. That's just the tooling for Android. Um, so once we check in code, get the GitLab runners, pull that Docker image down, compile everything in there. The beauty of that is now you have an environment where I could debug locally and figure out, OK, why is this not compiling? You know, Maybe it's an issue with the environment. But then it, you're getting that repeatable result when you have it um, in the cloud. We, we're exclusively using, um, within AWS GovCloud, uh, Amazon's container registry to register those images. It just made it a lot easier for us. Um, I know GitLab has some of the tooling to be able to be its own registry, but that was just easier for us. Um, what else? Mm. Yeah, so uh, one of the other things, we can go from app code check into live on a device in 15 minutes. So I'm going to beat up on the government on this one. There's a government agency we're working with, well, indirectly working with. Uh, for a mobile application update, it takes between one to two months to get it from submission to live on devices. <laughs> just, I know, it's like everyone's like, <laughs> "What is that?" But it's just the reality. They have a very um, manual process. They have integrators on site inspecting the applications, looking for vulnerabilities. They have nothing automated. Uh, we did a demo with our partner Now Secure using GitLab about uh, two months ago, where just went and changed the color on the application. Checked it in. It ran through Now Secure in about 10 minutes. Published it to MDM, and within 15 minutes from code check-in to deployment, we had the application updated. So you know, I, I really like to push back on people that say a lot of this stuff is hard. That it, it really isn't. Um, it's just a, you know, what is your determination of risk? I, I think with a lot of this automated deployment stuff, it's going to be education for. Uh, executives on, you know, how do you determine risk for this system? You know, some things you might want to take a month to, to dig through, but, you know, probably 99% of the solutions you're going to be pumping out, you know, it, it, it can be pushed out automatically. So, you know, I, I think the deployment process for GitLab is going to be, what is my risk? What's the risk of the organization? And how do we mitigate those things? Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of interest in the government right now of software factories. And you know, if you can't determine what your risk is for your project, you know, you're not going to be able to automate anything, in my opinion. And my favorite right now is with serverless, we can deploy in a minute and seven seconds uh, production ready from um, code check-in. Now, if you tie in more uh, testing, that obviously takes longer. But um, you know, I love serverless from, from that aspect of I can just, our website, all our documentation, our blog, are all serverless, and we can just update like that. I can sit here on my phone and, and make a change. So, you know, with with pools like that, you really are starting to get in, in a CI/CD process. You're really starting to see where where we can actually go when it's not a process. And you know, 
we're not worried about process anymore. We've solved all that. You know, what problems can we solve? So I know I have like another five minutes to talk. I figured if anybody had questions or comments, criticism. <laughs> Sorry it took a little while to get everything sorted. Um, but Yes, sir. So when you, uh, you mentioned the, the entire process of developing the application. Um, in terms of the risk management piece, you mentioned you're doing SAST and DAST. How much of that are you sharing with your government customers in terms of, you know, compliance and governance? Yeah. yeah so uh, everything. I mean, we give them all the reports. They have access to all the reports. Um, we, when we originally deployed the application, we actually had one of the NSA labs dig through it and try to find vulnerabilities as well. Um, DISA actually also had people dig through it. So it sort of validated our, well, here's all the automated tools that are giving us this output. So, you know, why do we have to add these other controls on top? And then, you know, the risk came down to, uh, you know, what, system, what backend systems are we integrating with? So our Air Force project, Bryce, this was, you know, Nobody laughed. It was the air, we deployed it in December of last year. It was the DOD's first uh, mobile application that used cellular slash Wi-Fi that connected to a legacy mainframe going through the cloud. Um, it's phenomenal that that was the first, but it was. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, or at least our government customers are still trying to come to grasp of, you know, even though it is a managed device, even though it is an application that they've run through testing, what's the risk of having some of that airplane data on the device if they get, one of them gets lost? They already, there's about a pilot of 200 uh, Air Force maintainers using that. They've already lost, you know, one of the devices was stolen out of their car already. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's all, you know, what is the risk of that data getting out there? Okay, well, we're encrypting it on, on the device with the key the user enters when they enter the application. So ideally that mitigates most of the risk, but you know, it, it's really dependent on the project. So you know, how are you building that risk mitigation into your, in, into your pipeline? It's probably a good question. <laughs> it's probably independent. You know, maybe that's a good feature for GitLab to add of here's your risk score of this project. And you know, so feature request. <laughs> um, yeah, so. And I, I will say, so our Air Force project started off um, before we were migrating to GitLab, and now that we're, we're in the process of migrating it to it um, outside of contract, simply because it makes everything so much easier to use. Uh, I mean, obviously under contract, but it, it wasn't a deliverable. But now that we have these tools available, it's really how do we automate, how do we make things faster so our customers can get to that point when they finally get some of their processes figured out where we can deploy this stuff in a day versus uh, two months because that two month life cycle or that two month cycle of deploying is a killer of agile development. I mean, you, you can't develop agile anything with a two month deployment cycle. So, could you talk to the the governance aspect? So, part of what we run into sometimes. Okay, technically that's feasible, but <laughs> I have authority to operate, or I'm a financial. Could you maybe talk about any of the lessons learned you had about incorporating the governance process so that it could take advantage of this technology that you've done? Yeah, so some of the governance came down to of, you know, who at, you know, from the, the level I look at, who has access to those repositories? So, you know, it's control of, you know, there are some organizations where if you're part of the organization, you get access to all the code. I'm not a big proponent of that. You know, I'm, I'm a very much a proponent of need to know. So if I don't need to have access to that mobile application or server stack, I should not have access to it. Um, how are you doing your code check? So, you know, it, what developer is doing your code check? What are you doing for static and dynamic analysis? You know, our, our customers have to accept that those reports are valid. Um, you know, that's, that's up to them. That's a determination we can't make. Right. Um, but it's trying to show the government, here's how we're trying to limit the risk that this solution, you know, these integration points are, are presenting. So I, there's no silver bullet from it. I mean, we're still arguing with our, you know, some people over or some of these things. So, you know, it's <laughs> slowly but surely. Okay. And, you know, and especially for our government customers, you know, a lot of this stuff is very new. Um, so it's just trying to, 
get them to come to grips with, you know, commercial industry has been doing CICD for years now. There's no, there's nothing really scary about it.